Hey, Cryptosons, it's 10 p.m. Pacific time. My name is Nicodemus, and welcome back to the Crypto Overnighter, where we take a nightly look at the crypto, NFT, and metaverse space. And keep in mind, nothing in this show should ever be considered financial advice. And here we are again on a Thursday, December 22nd, 2022. And let's just start things off with a bit of a follow up from last night. The president of Brazil signed a bill today that legalizes the use of cryptocurrency as a payment method in the country. The bill was approved by the Chamber of Deputies on November 29th, and it will become law on December 31st. Brazil's new law allows residents to use certain cryptocurrencies as legal payment methods, but they cannot use it as legal tender like you can in El Salvador. Now, this law also creates a licensing system for virtual asset service providers, VASPs, but punishes fraud using digital assets. It is not clear which agency will oversee crypto payments, but securities classified as digital assets will be regulated by Brazil's Securities and Exchange Commission. This law also requires exchanges to distinguish between user and company assets. So you know they were thinking of FTX when they wrote that part. The crypto law will become effective in June 2023, 180 days from now. The current president of Brazil will leave office soon and will be replaced by Luiz Ignacio da Silva on January 1st. Now, they have previously expressed support for cryptocurrency and blockchain adoption during their previous presidency from 2003 to 2010. Now, let's switch gears and go from South America over to Asia, where a report from South Korea's National Intelligence Service says that North Korean hackers have stolen more than $620 million worth of crypto from decentralized finance platforms this year. The agency said they've also blocked an average of 1.18 million daily attacks from national and international hacking organizations in November. The NIS spokesperson said that all of these $620 million stolen through DeFi exploits happened overseas and that there was no real damage in Korea because virtual asset transactions have been switched to real name transactions and security has been strengthened. In 2021, South Korea introduced new rules for cryptocurrency trading that require clients to create a real name account with the same bank as their cryptocurrency exchange to deposit or withdraw funds. The bank and the exchange must then verify the client's identity. Exchanges must also get a license from the Financial Services Commission before operating. North Korean hacker groups, like Lazarus Group, have been linked to several major DeFi breaches this year. This would include the $100 million Harmony attack. Experts believe that these attacks are a way for North Korea to generate foreign currency reserves despite strict sanctions from the international community. NAS also warned that North Korean cyber attacks will increase next year and it's important to analyze attacks as closely as defenses. They also show the need to gather information about malicious code used by different attackers to gain valuable insights. Senator Pat Toomey introduced a bill that would create a federal framework for stablecoins and help Congress make decisions about future cryptocurrency regulation. Toomey said that the regulatory model that he proposed will not give an advantage to existing companies over their competitors. Now, Toomey is an important figure in the Senate Banking Committee. He has a lot of influence on cryptocurrency policy. Now, he has created a bill called the Stablecoin Transparency of Reserves and Uniform Safe Transactions Act of 2022. This bill would create a federal license for companies that issue payment stablecoins. The license would also be available for banks, non-depository trust companies, national trust banks, and state-based money-transmitting businesses. Now, Toomey believes that stablecoins could be used in many ways in the physical economy. His proposal would require issuers to fully support their payment stablecoins with high-quality liquid assets. This bill would also require issuers to make public disclosures, including information about the assets supporting the payment stablecoin, redemption policies, and statements from public accounting firms. Toomey's bill was created while House lawmakers were working on their own stablecoin proposal. The House Financial Services Committee plans to advance a stablecoin bill in the future. The Trust Act, which is a part of Toomey's bill, would define terms like digital asset and payment stablecoin. It would also specify that payment stablecoins are not securities 
and issuers are not investment companies or investment advisors. This legislation includes privacy provisions, such as clarifying that private transactions that do not involve a financial institution or intermediary do not need to be reported. Toomey's new policy follows the release of a stablecoin discussion draft in April. Toomey hopes that the new framework for the policy will allow his colleagues to pass legislation in the future that will protect customer funds without limiting innovation. Now, all this time through the FTX saga, I've made note a few times that Sam alone was being charged. I ask, where are the charges against the rest? What about Caroline? Well, we know what happened with Caroline now. Caroline and Gary Wang both pled guilty to charges related to FTX. That's according to U.S. Attorney Damian Williams. The U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission and the Commodities Futures Trading Commission also announced charges against the two, stating that Ellison manipulated the price of FTT, which is an exchange token issued by FTX. That was done at the direction of FTX founder Sam Bankman-Fried. And we're going to talk about FTT here in a bit. But Ellison and Wang are both cooperating with investors, according to Williams. The U.S. attorney for the Southern District of New York did not disclose the charges against the two. Additionally, court records were not immediately available. SEC Deputy Enforcement Director Sanjay Wadwi stated that Ellison, Wang, and SBF participated in the scheme to hide important information from FTX investors. They attempted to artificially increase the value of FTT. Now, FTT was used as collateral for undisclosed loans. These are loans that Alameda received from FTX through an undisclosed and virtually unlimited line of credit. I need one of those lines of credit, especially around Christmas time. This complaint states that Sam made public statements that Alameda did not receive preferential treatment from FTX. However, the complaint states that all three of them knew or were reckless in not knowing that these statements were false or misleading and that they were important to FTX's investors because of their involvement in the fraudulent scheme. Now, Wadwa said in a press release that Ellison, Wang, and Sam secretly transferred FTX's customer funds to Alameda to hide the risks that FTX investors and customers faced. Reportedly, Ellison is being targeted by prosecutors for her role in manipulating the exchange token FTT. Now, that token is what Alameda used as collateral for investments. In early December, Ellison, who is believed to live in Hong Kong or Nassau, was seen in Manhattan at a coffee shop, leading many to believe that she was cooperating with the authorities. And we have made mention of that sighting a few times on this show. Because shortly after being seen in Manhattan, Caroline hired the law firm Wilmer Hale to represent her. That firm's top attorney, Stephanie Vakian, is a former director of the SEC's Division of Enforcement. The SEC's case mentions that time when Ellison tweeted an offer to purchase Binance's entire stake of FTT for 22 bucks a piece at the direction of Sam. She was actually a bit ruder about it, but that's the gist of the tweet. The complaint also stated that Ellison tweeted about the integrity of Alameda's balance sheet in response to a Coindesk article at the request of Sam. Williams advised, those who participated in misconduct at FTX or Alameda they should come forward soon, saying that they are moving quickly and will not wait forever. Never one to waste a crisis or tragedy, the U.S. government is seeing this as an opportunity. Because in their complaint against Ellison and Wang, the SEC has established FTT is a security. Or so they claim. Now that's really putting all the other exchange tokens on notice. Because in their complaint filed against Ellison and Wang, the SEC stated that if demand for trading on FTX platform increases, demand for the FTT token could also increase. They argued that this would benefit FTT holders in proportion to their holdings. The SEC said, quote, The large allocation of tokens to FTX incentivized the FTX management team to take steps to attract more users onto the trading platform and, therefore, increase demand for and increase the trading price of the FTT token. The complaint also mentioned that FTX used money from the FTT token sale to fund its business and that the exchange token was presented as an investment in marketing materials. It is also noted that the success of FTX was dependent on the efforts of its management team. The SEC's decision regarding FTT 
has raised questions about similar tokens issued by rival crypto exchanges. The regulator is particularly concerned with FTX's buyback and burn practice, which is also used by other centralized exchanges such as Binance and OKX. Now, so far, the prices of exchange tokens have not been negatively influenced. According to CoinGecko, BNB has been stable, while OKB has increased by nearly 2%. Kronos, HT, and KCS have all seen small price increases of less than 1.5%. But maybe Chair Gensler plans to go further, because their actions suggest the SEC is increasing its efforts to address crypto assets. Because the SEC recently won a case against LIBOR, and now the SEC has charged Sam, Caroline, and Gary with securities fraud for manipulating the price of FTT and offering it as an unregistered security. Now, this follows similar actions taken by the SEC in the past. The complaint against FTX also includes additional language about FTT. The SEC's complaint against FTX on Wednesday described FTT as a, quote, illiquid crypto asset security. The SEC views FTT as a security in itself, regardless of how it was offered or sold. Chair Gensler also referred to FTT as a exchange crypto security token that was integral to FTX. Now, this verbiage could mark a shift in the SEC's approach to security regulation, potentially leading to increased regulation of the crypto industry. Because you know how it goes. If the SEC can convince courts that crypto tokens like FTT are securities, then the agency will be able to pursue more than just the projects that create them. That means it could also target any intermediaries that sell the tokens. This could expose major crypto exchanges like Coinbase, Kraken, and Binance to significant legal liability and force them to either operate on registered exchanges like the New York Stock Exchange or shut down. So maybe get familiar with your DeFi options for trading and get your money off the exchange because it looks like Gary is coming for those exchanges. Last month, when the SEC won their case against Library, the judge implied that Library's native token, LBC, could be considered a security. This is a significant step forward in the SEC's efforts to label all tokens as securities. Now, it also looks like the SEC has changed its approach to targeting marketplaces and intermediaries rather than just individual products. A federal judge approved a $250 million bond for Sam Bankman-Fried at his first U.S. court appearance. The first of many, I'm sure. Bankman-Fried will be allowed to stay at his parents' house in Palo Alto, California, while awaiting trial. So, there's a lesson for you, kids. I'm not saying you should grow up to be a crypto criminal. But if you do, make sure you're on good terms with mommy and daddy and make sure you bought them a big old house just in case you need to do a little in-home confinement. And Sam is still continuing to break records. Nicholas Roos is a prosecutor and he told the U.S. magistrate judge that this is the highest ever pre-trial bond. Now it's a package that includes the $250 million bond itself as well as home detention and location monitoring. U.S. Magistrate Judge Gabriel Gorenstein took away Sam's piggy bank, so Sam won't be able to spend more than $1,000 except on defense-related costs. He's not allowed to start a business without court approval, and he will also have to surrender his passport. Sam's defense counsel said that he agreed to those conditions and that Sam voluntarily came to face the charges, which I bet he was pretty happy to get back to the United States. And he wasn't even doing real time. He got special treatment. I'll get to that in a bit. Sam's attorney also stated that the extradition to the Bahamas could take months or even years and that his parents are Stanford professors. The defense requested that Bankman Freed be released on bail. The judge said that it would be impossible for Sam to skip out on his bail because of his notoriety. Therefore, the judge allowed Sam to be released. The Complex Frauds and Cybercrime Unit at the Southern District of New York U.S. Attorney's Office is handling the case against Sam. Now, Sam was being held in Fox Hill Prison in Nassau. Rather than being thrown in with the general population, he was kept in sickbay. He had access to amenities such as a toilet, running water, a TV, local newspapers, crossword puzzles, and vegan food. He reportedly spent his days watching the news and reading articles about himself. One guard that they talked to said that Sam was a little arrogant but quiet. 
He said that Sam seemed scared when he arrived. And I'm sure he was. I would expect that his lawyers told him where he was going and that a report stated that maximum security cells for men at Fox Hill Prison were small and that they held up to six people, but there was no mattress, no toilet facilities. Inmates had to use buckets to remove human waste. They complained about the lack of beds and bedding. Some prisoners developed bed sores from laying on the ground. The cells had sanitation issues and were infested with rats, maggots, and insects. But that's not how it went for Sam. He had it a little easier. Sam was held in sick bay, where he slept on a cot, and there were only four other occupants in the room. Many other prisoners at the facility are held in overcrowded, poorly ventilated cells with rats, having to sleep on the floor with makeshift materials. The U.S. State Department published a report in 2021 stating that Fox Hill had harsh conditions, including overcrowding, poor nutrition, inadequate sanitation and medical care, and physical abuse by corrections officers. And that's going to do it for us tonight. I want to thank you, my listeners, because when you stop listening, I will stop talking. We'll see you tomorrow night.